But yeah, what I want to um, do, first apologise for my voice, it's a bit croaky, I don't normally sound like this, but I managed to pick up a cold on the plane on the way over. Um, as I said, I want to look at this more from a conceptual level, really, than from a specific level, partly because I don't teach very much face-to-face -face anymore, I have a more institutional role, and um, that's not on the screen, really. Oh, so, sorry, 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 sorry. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, and, and also because listening to all the people speaking today reminds me just how context um, all these implementations of e-learning and online assessment are. So I'm going to talk from a conceptual level but use a couple of examples um, from my own institutional context to illustrate the concepts I'm talking about. Um, what you saw, if you can flick back to the last one a minute, was just some of the um, examples of online assessment tools that um, academics in my university use. We're quite a rare university these days because we have our own homegrown learning management system. That's you know both a good and a bad thing. I think one of the good things is it's um, sparked a lot of creativity because the limitations of the learning management system allow creative people to you know, develop alternatives. Some of these tools up here were developed in-house and some of them weren't. In fact, it's um, about half and half maybe or probably more with the homegrown. So they're all for different purposes. Some of them cost money, some of them are available free, um, but they are all serving very different purposes. So the next one. So yeah, in fact, if you can go on one more, just looking at some of the particular issues that have driven um, developments in online assessment in my institution. One is this productivity thing. Um, we're a very large organization. Uh, we have first year classes with 1,500 and larger numbers of students. So, you know, we've got some very creative teachers that manage that really well. But in that sort of situation, marking workloads are hideous. Um, they're really onerous. Um, students are not always satisfied with the feedback that they get. It's not a very um, productive use of feedback when, uh, you know, the workload. This quote is actually from a UK survey, but it sums up our situation so well that I um, use that. So students dissatisfied with the assessment and feedback, staff dissatisfied as well because the workload is huge. And actually often what we were finding was that students weren't even coming to pick up their marked assignments. So, you know, how disheartening when you've just spent a week or something and there's a pile of marked assignments outside your office door, nobody's coming to pick them up. So um, how can technology help with this one? Uh, one of the... Um, tools that costs money, it's not a really particularly sophisticated tool or anything like that, but it's one that um, a lot of our lecturers have found can be really useful to increase their productivity in this area. So Grademark is one of the Turnitin tools. It doesn't have to be that. Um, I'm sure there are other tools that do very similar things. In fact, I know there are because some of our um, lecturers are using them. But um, it's, it's just basically a marking assistant. So it allows you to uh, go through the assessments a lot more quickly. If you're um, using teams of tutors to mark, which we tend to do on the large scale courses, um, you know, giving a rubric for the marking can help to sort of ensure consistent standards across the teams. Um, and when you've got things like voice um, comments and you know, pre-prepared comments that you can just drag onto an assignment, and um, these are all submitted online. It really makes the um, task much easier, and also uh, students do pick it up when they know there's time for them to do something um, about it before they submit their final assessment. So that's been one really useful tool, and that's a productivity tool rather than anything. And although it does have implications for learning, um, it's something that has been, you know, simple but very useful. So that is one example, the productivity tool. The next one, um, you know, in a sort of large-scale university, it's very tempting to lecture and do tutorials and do things in very traditional ways. Well, 
We kind of know that that's a very dated teaching model and it has some severe limitations as many of our course statistics were showing high dropout rates, you know, poor performance, students in large first year courses not really achieving well and then, you know, what happens in second, third and fourth years is uh, really not a, an attractive site. So what, um, you know, some of the things that have been done about this one. Uh, this is another of our tools. This one is actually developed in-house, but it's now used in um, about 700 universities worldwide. Um, it's Again, it's not a really sophisticated tool. Um, this one is all about multi-choice questions, but actually it's the students that write the questions. So it is a great catalyst for learning because to write good questions, and it's quite competitive because, you know, they um, look at each other's questions, they answer each other's questions, and they rate each other's questions with their recommender systems. So to do that, the students actually have to, you know, do the readings, do the coursework, and actually know the <coughs> subject and decide what is a good question. And so they get feedback from each other. Um, and the lecturers who use this actually end up with a huge item bank of really good quality questions. So there's many layers of learning and understanding happening in that context, um, just simply by you know getting the students to write the questions. So um, <coughs> as a catalyst for learning, it's really useful. As a way to model the standards, um, it's really useful. And um, student-generated content is something that, you know, I'm a great believer is a useful way to go. Students can create some really amazing resources if you give them the chance. And the peer feedback is a really um, productive thing as well. Okay, so that's another one. Another issue is this kind of old-school transmission approach, which, uh, you know, the quote here says that sometimes what you're assessing if you're using this kind of learning is not actually what you set out to assess in the first place. It's kind of rote learning or it's book learning or it's something. And I think the example um, that, uh, was it Ruth? Ruth, yeah, Ruth just gave about the, um, no, it wasn't. It was, who was on last? The one just Monica. Monica, yeah. sorry, mixing up the names. Said that, you know, it's no longer enough to write about what you've achieved, you actually have to demonstrate it. If you flick on to the next one, um, this idea of authentic tasks, whether using simulations or whether, you know, actually um, engaging with real world content, this is an example from an engineering course. Uh, I had to take out another one that I had in there because I couldn't allow that um, image to be shared out. It's behind our login. But students are generating resources again. Um, you know, they're generating training videos, not being told how to make videos, just assuming that they will find that out in their project teams with the simple tools we have available these days. And so they're actually working with real world examples and they're engaging with you know, real situations. And we can't send as many students as we have out for internships or industry placement, but we can with the tools that we have actually and get students working on authentic tasks, which hopefully will go some way to addressing, you know, the complaints that we have from a lot of employers that, you know, these graduates have a degree certificate, but they actually don't necessarily know how to apply the skills they've learned in the classroom. So that's three, the productivity, um, you know, the authentic, authentic tasks and the student generation generated resources that I think are ways of uh, uh, assessing that are a catalyst for learning. It can also obviously go into the assessment of learning, but I'm really interested in assessment for learning as a catalyst. So, next one. Um, another question is how do we actually get this beyond the realm of the enthusiast or, you know, the one person who had that great idea who was willing to put in all the work to make it happen, because these things do take a lot of time, investment, and creativity, which in our busy lives and our, you know, pressured um, academic job, not easy to find that time. And a lot of people, in fact, don't and won't. So how can we sort of look at taking these um, great ideas beyond the realms of the lone enthusiast? 
this is more the level that I work at now. I work in a research center, but I'm much more about strategic engagement and building capacity around e-learning. And there's been a lot of research, my own and done by others, that say that all these um, all these conditions are actually what you need. The first person I was aware of probably that wrote in this context was Shirley Alexander. I think she was at one of the Sydney universities at the time. So you need a supportive policy context, which includes workloads, counting policies, um, you know, recognition and rewards for teaching innovation, <coughs> various other things at that level. Uh, we need easy to use tools. Um, thankfully, the days when tools were really complex are over. So I'm just going to go and grab my glass of water here. That frog jumped back into it. Yeah, so giving people incentives, rewards, easy to use tools flexible and reusable resources so they don't have to be reinvented every time. Um, networks for dissemination and sharing, networks like this one, where you know, people hear what others are doing and pick up ideas that they can maybe take and um, implement in their own context. So those are, um, you know, it's quite a lot of boxes to tick. And it's a very sort of bigger picture um, perspective, but when I hear, um, you know, something like we've got a new e-learning strategy in the institution, in the country, or you know, in the faculty. I kind of wonder, well, how much do those people writing and um, uh, proposing the strategy actually realise about how that filters down to practice level? Um, sometimes I think they think there's a magic pill. And everybody will be doing e-learning, you know, on a magic wand. Wouldn't that be nice? But we wouldn't sort of learn as much um, by doing that. So that's quite a big picture. But just to um, finish on a uh, hopefully a positive note, <coughs> there's a lot of new capabilities as well as new challenges in the current context, and I think it's. Um, I think it's a really interesting time. I mean, I don't often use the terms paradigm shift because you know, they don't happen very often. But I do think there's something fundamentally different happening here. Um, because the way the system has been working in the past isn't really working anymore. You know, all these things like managing scale, which we have large scale, and with something like MOOCs, it's um, promising to get even larger. Um, ensuring integrity in the current context is a really hard thing to do. How many people here have teenagers who just take it for granted that sharing things on the internet is an okay thing to do? You know, they don't have the same kind of awareness of copyright issues, of um, you know, all that kind of intellectual property, doing things as individuals. It's a different world um, that our young people are living in. And so it makes our institutions and their rules look a little bit out of step, I think. And we can keep on trying to educate our staff and students. Maybe what we need to do is think differently about these rules and all these things. Um, it's very difficult to control anyway. In fact, it's probably impossible to control these days because you know, students report that they're doing something, but actually they're doing something else. They're just not going to admit it because they think it's not the right thing to do. Uh, and it's not because they're bad. It's just because, you know, the rules are changing. The game is changing. So there's all sorts of new capabilities with these new tools and with these new approaches. Um, but I think there are other tensions there as well. And the really big picture um, thing for me is that the accreditation model is not really working particularly well anymore because has anybody heard the saying that businesses in America will not apply, employ graduates with Harvard MBAs because they've got great ideas but they know nothing practical. But they've got degrees from you know, one of the best universities in the country. So there's something wrong with that picture. 
um, the accreditation models say that people can learn things, but it doesn't necessarily say they can do what you need them to be able to do. It's not across the board, of course, but it is a reasonable generalization. And I think the economic model isn't working either. I mean, young people coming out of university nowadays with huge amounts of debt that it's going to take them years to pay off, it affects their lives in ways that are probably not all positive. <coughs> so about the future, or where are we going? Well, I like the idea of assessment as a catalyst for learning, whether that happens in um, an institution or in a less formal environment. And I wonder about employers also using authentic tasks. So instead of sitting somebody down, interviewing them, looking at what's on their CV, on their credential, get them to do something. Um, you know, get them to demonstrate that they um, can do. Now, that may not matter if they have the degree, the piece of paper that says they can do it, or it may not. I really don't know where the future is going, but I think it's going somewhere interesting and somewhere different. As I said to Lee in the car this morning, I'm probably too old to really see where the future is, because you know, TV was the brand new technology when I was growing up. But um, there's really <laughs> interesting shifts going on, I think. So that's my 10 minutes worth. I don't know if it's been 10 minutes or 8 or 9. <laughs>